Uh, very unusual um, passage this morning. You know, maybe not so. There's a father mentioned here that I wanted to go over, but I mainly want to not necessarily speak to the fathers, but to the children of good fathers. And then I want to speak to us in general as children of the Heavenly Father. I'm going to tell you something. Here's, here's the battle we have. Um, if you go, and I have. I preached in the, the prison there in Ridgeland. And you go and talk to a lot of them people. You know what a, a lot of those people have in common? Guess who was absent in the home? Father. The vast majority of those people that you talk to father was absent in the home I'm going to tell you something if you're here and you're a father and you had a bad father don't be one set the example and change turn the page in your family turn the page but if you're here and you had a good father remember the example he set for you he wasn't perfect was he he didn't do everything right he didn't get judgment right every time but I'm going to tell you, Daddy, one of the best things you can do when you get it wrong is own it. Own it. A lot of fathers have problems with pride, and they won't own when they do something wrong, they get it wrong. Your kids need to see that example, that tenderness to want to get right. Because how are they going to get right with God if, you, if you're not willing to get right with them? They're not going to see that testimony of getting right. Now, Jeremiah 35, we are... Uh, going to be introduced to the Rechabites. If you look at them, the story here is pretty amazing. If you think about what's going on, we'll read Jeremiah 35. There's a, a man, their father gave them a command. Now this is during the time of Elijah. Um, and there's a man that's going to be introduced when we go to First King, or Second Kings. His name is going to be um, Jehu. And Jehu is... Uh, a man that God raises up. How many of you heard the story of Ahab and Jezebel? Y'all know them, don't you? Ahab and Jezebel. The Bible says of, of Ahab, he was one of the worst kings. He said that there was no other king in Israel that sowed the wickedness that Jahab, uh, Ahab did. I put them together, Jahab. But Ahab did. There's no other king that sowed that wickedness. So what happened is God raised up. During Elijah's time period, he made a promise that he was going to judge uh, Ahab and Jezebel through Elijah and he raises up this man named Jehu who is going to wind up being company with the father that's going to be mentioned here this morning you begin to get a glimpse of the character of this father but pretty amazing father that his children would be obedient let's read about him he says the word of the Lord came into Jeremiah from the Lord saying uh, Lord in the days of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah king of Judah saying, Go into the house of the Rechabites, and speak unto them, and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Then I took uh, Jezaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of uh, Habazin, Habazaniah, Habazaniah, help me with that one, Habazaniah, uh, looks like, yeah, that's good enough. I wasn't speaking in tongues. And his brethren, and his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites. And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hannah, Hanan, the son of Igdalia, a man of God, which was by the chambers of the princes, which is above the chamber of Messiah, son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine and cups and said unto them, Drink ye wine. But they said, We will not, uh, we will drink no wine, for John, uh, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, Neither ye nor your sons forever. Neither shall ye build houses, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyard, and ha or have, nor have any. But all your days ye shall dwell in tents, 
that ye may live many days in the land where ye be strangers. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he charged us to drink no wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in, neither have we vineyard or field or sea. We have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and have done according to to all that Jonadab our father commanded us. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came up into the land that we said come let us go to Jerusalem for fear of army of the Chaldeans for we fear the army of the Syrians so we dwelt at Jerusalem. Then came the word of the Lord Jeremiah saying thus saith the Lord of hosts the God of Israel go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, we will not receive instruction to hearken. Oh, uh, ye w- will ye not receive instruction to hearken unto my word, saith the Lord. And the words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, and, and, and that he commanded his sons not to drink wine are performed. For unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment. Notwithstanding, I've spoken unto you rising early and speaking, but ye hearkened not unto me. I have sent also unto you my servant, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from the e- uh, his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them, and ye shall dwell in the land which I have given you and your fathers but ye have not inclined your ear to hearken unto me. Because the son of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them, but this people have not hearkened unto me. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I pronounced against them, because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard. I have called unto them, but they have not answered. Jeremiah said to the house of the Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept all his precepts, and done according to all that he hath commanded you. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me, Forever. It's amazing. I got to thinking about this passage. This is uh, probably the most incredible passage. Almost seems unreal. Here they are, generations later. Jonadab, their father, commanded them not to drink wine, not to have houses. And you're going to see there's a purpose to all of this in just a minute. They, here they are with their wives, their sons, and their daughters, and they are holding the commandment that their father gave them, which is a good commandment. It's amazing, isn't it? What causes children to listen generations later? It amazes me. It amazes me. That's a tough thing, isn't it? But this man must have been very special. Well, we'll look a little bit at his life when we go to 2 Kings in just a minute, but notice... His children have confidence in him. This is the thing I notice about this. The attributes of a godly father. What makes his character such that they want to obey? We'll look at that in just a minute. But look at verse number 5 through 8. What word do you find all through this thing? Obey. What causes causes people to obey a father? Now listen to me. I'm not asking you to focus on your earthly father. I'm asking you to focus on your heavenly father this morning. Because what would cause people generations later to still be obedient to their heavenly father? You know what we're lacking in this day and age? Generations, the next generations that still want to follow God and still want to love God. It seems like it's few and far in between. Where are they at? 
Where are they at? It's not because there aren't still people standing for what's right. It's because somewhere down the line, they have ignored the commandment of a godly father or a godly mother. And I want to focus on you a little bit too, Father. Listen, what kind of example are you setting for your home? What kind of example are you setting for your home? Are you holding the line? Or are you doing what you want? Here's the problem with a lot of fathers in this generation. And I, I did it too when I was younger. It was all about me and what I wanted. Can I say something to you? It's a wonderful day when you realize it ain't about you. And 15 years down the road, you're going to have influence on them kids. Listen, listen. There's one sitting right there. That boy's going to be 15 one time. That boy's going to be 20 one time. He's going to be 25. He's going to be 30. He's going to be 35, Lord willing. 40. He's just going to keep going. And you know the influence? Who's going to have influence over him? It's going to be mama and daddy. And daddy, I'm going to tell you, if you think your role is light, you're wrong. You're wrong. You've got a heavy role in the home. You are the head of your home ordained by God. You say, well, who? That's what the Bible yeah. says in Ephesians chapter number 5. Amen. Now that, you're the, you're the, you're the rule of the home. The wife is to guide the home. This is, this is a mistake that a lot of men make. Myself included when I was young. You don't own her. It is to your benefit to use your godly woman to influence your home and your household. If you ignore that, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be in trouble. Listen, you are to manage. Listen, when you go to war, when a man goes to war, you think about it. In your home, you're the head of your home. You know what you are? You're the captain. You're the general. You're way up there. And if you're not careful, a big mistake a general makes is not knowing how to use his people. You need to know how to use the people you got. Listen to me. I got different kids. I, I got, I got my kids here and scattered abroad. Some of them back here. It would be a mistake for me to have the same expectation of doing certain things for every kid. Some kids are good at some things. Some kids are better at other things. So what you have to learn to do, which is difficult, I wish I had learned this earlier. You need to learn to use the talent that's in your home. You need to learn to utilize the talent that is in your home, wherever they're at. That's your issue. You, it's, a, it's, a, it's a war. You've got to think of it as a war. And you need to have a strategy in your home. Father, let me tell you something. How do you think a man like Jonadab got his family to obey his commandment generations later? Do you think he just said, hey, do this? And walked away? That man was a man who was setting an example in his home. He was a man that was taking a stand himself. He had to have been a man who wasn't a hypocrite because they would not look to him anyway. He was setting the standard in his own home. Listen, do you think Jonadab told his family not to do those things and he was doing them? Listen to me. Listen to me. You can preach to your kids all day long what not to do and what to do, but if you're not doing it yourself, it means nothing. You need to have a game plan. You need to have a game plan. You need to stick to it. Listen, brother, let me tell you something. You got them little kids? You need to sit down. I'm telling every father here. I'm not just singling you out. I love you to death. You know I don't. But this finger's pointing to you right now. Right? Listen to me. You need to be sitting them down and having a time, if it's two days a week, one day a week, three days a week, where you are reading the Bible with them and you are praying. Don't leave that up to mama. You set the standard in the home. You lead the home. You be a godly leader and you control the tempo. You control the environment in your own home. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it will make a huge difference you, right now, you may not see. You might Listen, this is what we do. This is what I did. I did. When these two was younger, I was out of whack. And they'll testify. I was out of whack. I was out of whack. I had my priorities out of order. 
And these other four are home. We read three days a week. You know what I didn't do when they were home that I wish I did? I didn't do what I'm doing with the other four now. I didn't do it when they were home. Because you know what my priorities were? I've got to figure out how to pay bills. Can I say something to you? You will regret that 15 years from now, 20 years from now. You, will, you say, how do you know? I am living it. I'm trying to prevent you from making the same mistake I made. You hear me? That's all I can do. I can't go back and fix what I did, but I can prevent the next generation from making the same error that I did. Michael, love you to death, buddy. Let me tell you something. I baptized you right up there. You told me you were saved. Did you? You better set the tempo and home. That boy right there is going to follow in your footsteps. Are you a Jonadab? Are you an Ahab? Listen. Don't get upset with it. Fix it. Just fix it. It ain't that hard. Just fix it. Brother, we need. Listen, brother. Y'all are young. Set the example in your home. You can come here and be a blessing to us too and set an example. You guys are young. God can do amazing things with your life. You sell yourself short sometimes. Listen. I had somebody. I had a preacher, a pastor friend of mine. I sat with him uh, Friday night. And, and um, he, said, he said something along the line that some people don't live up to their potential. And I said, brother, this is what I've learned. If people will learn to trust God and step out and do it His way, there is no limit on the potential. There is no such thing as potential. He has exceeded the potential that I have in my life. And I'm telling you, He will do the same thing in your life. you got to make up your mind. Listen, I talk, I, 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 this is this way with my children. Listen to me. You guys were taught what's right. You guys can do more for the glory of God than you're doing. I love you. But you have the ability and the tools to do more for God than what you're currently doing. When you have your children, are you going to be a Jonadab? Son, you've always wanted children. You've told me this over and over. But son, maybe God hasn't given you those children you want because you ain't ready to be the example you need to be. You need to be a godly man. And the only person who can make that choice is you. And I say this because I love you. All these people know I love you. The reason I tell you the truth, I love you. But Jonadab had to set the example in his home or else they wouldn't have followed him. Listen, you need to be an example. Get the things right. You say, well, I've done so much, I regret it. Get it right and move forward. Just go forward. Quit talking about how bad off you've done and what you've done. About Get it right. Because we got a God, a Father, a Heavenly Father, who is so merciful, who will let you get it right. Just get it right. Who cares what anybody else thinks? Go on and do something for the glory of God. You can do it if you'll make up your mind, I'm tired of being where I'm at, I'm going forward. Let's look at this. Look at this man's life. Go to uh, uh, 2 Kings. We'll come back there. We ain't done there. We're going to try to stay there this morning. 2 Kings chapter, uh, Brother Nettles uh, say, I, I done, I done, I'm meddling, I'm meddling. But let me tell you something, meddling preaching will stir you up to do something for the Lord. Listen, we don't come here to be entertained, we come here to get our heart right with God and go forward. Go forward. 2 Kings chapter number 10. 2 Kings 10. The only other mention, there's one other mention of this fellow, but we get details about this Jonadab's life. I told you Jehu is avenging uh, uh, the blood that Ahab and Jezebel have shed. Uh, you think about Ahab and Jezebel, they killed prophets. What kind of king kills men of God? 
Think about that. Can you imagine a king in our generation who sought out and his number one mission was to kill preachers? That's the way Ahab was. Because a lot of people say, well, why did God judge them? That's why he judged them. He finally rose up somebody to stop that. Watch this, verse number 10. Know now that there shall fall on, unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord uh, have done that which he spake by the servant of Elijah. So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab and Jezreel, and all his uh, great men and his kinfolks and his priests, and all them uh, until he left uh, him none remaining. And there arose and departed and came to Samaria. And as he was uh, at the shearing house in the way, Jehu met the uh, children of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and said, Who are you? And they answered, We are the children of Ahaziah. We go down to salute the children of the king and the children of the queen. And he said, Take them alive. And he took them alive and slew them in a pit of the shearing house, uh, even two and forty men. Uh, neither left he any of them. Now watch this. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jonadab, the son of Rechab. That's the same man we're talking about in Jeremiah. Coming to meet him. And he saluted him and said unto him, Is thine heart right? As my heart is, uh, is with thy heart. And Jonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up into the... Uh, the, uh, unto him, uh, to him and to the chariot and he said come with me and see my zeal for the Lord so they made him ride in his chariot you find out he's riding through all these judgments you know what they do they go in the house of Baal Baal was a false god in their day and they go in there and destroy the house of Baal and you know who's with Jehu the whole time destroying this house of Baal Jonadab can I tell you something about godly men? When the preacher starts preaching about the wickedness of this world, godly men side with him. You hear me? Jonadab sided with the truth. He sided with God. Listen, which side are you on? Which side are you on? Well, preacher, I don't know if I'd say it like that. But are you really hearing what God has to say about it? Are you really hearing the problem that it's going to cause if we don't judge sin? The Bible says if we judge ourselves, we'd not be judged. John Adams was on the right side. He took a stand. Let's go back. Go back to Jeremiah 35. Jeremiah 35. I'll try to stay in Jeremiah 35 as much as I can. And, and, uh, because it's, there's a lot that's written here. Notice, first of all, his children had to have confidence in what he said over and over. Uh, you know, listen, a lot of times as children, I don't understand this. Why did he tell them not to have houses? I'm going to show you that here in a minute. But I'm sure these children are like, why can't we have houses? Why can't we plant? Why can't we do this? Why, why can't we? You, listen, one thing he took a stand on is the fact that he wasn't going to have wine in his house. That's a blessing. That he took that stand. But, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like it's important until you begin to look at the passage and see God use that to protect them. Listen, a godly man, he sees what's coming down the road. And he shelters his home. What are you doing in your home? Are you sheltering your home? Or are you exposing your home to all the wickedness of this world? Watch what he says here. Look at verse number 11. Verse number 11, look what he says. But it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came into the land that, he, uh, that we said, Come, let us get down to Jerusalem, for we feel the armies of the Chaldeans for the fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwelt at Jerusalem. So let me ask you something. What benefit did this family have that they were mobile? Nebuchadnezzar came in to conquer if they would have had homes that were permanent, guess what? They would have been conquered. 
because this man recognized God is fixing to judge this land and I'm not planting down right here. My home is somewhere else. <laughs> this man recognized God is about done with these people. And he said, I'm not putting a permanent dwelling right here. This is not where I'm going to dwell. I want the ability to flee the enemy. And you know what? Nebuchadnezzar comes in. You know what he does? Him and his hightail it to Jerusalem. Listen, the heart of it all, Jerusalem. The most fortified place, Jerusalem. They hightail it. That's a godly man who can see trouble. Go to the book of Proverbs. Book of Proverbs. I want you to see this. Proverbs chapter 22. As a father, I hope that you shelter your kids. When you see evil coming, I'm hoping that you are the one who steps up and says, we need to be careful because this evil's coming down the road. Watch what he says in Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, verse 3. He says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and does what? Hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. You know what John and Dab did? He elected to hide his children in Jerusalem. When the evil came... He took off to a place that was safer than where he was at. Go to Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. Same thing that said. Proverbs 27 verse 12. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and punish it. The Bible tells you that twice. You know what? When the Word of God tells you something twice, you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to get your attention. Look, there's things that are going to come in your life. You're going to have to shelter yourself your family from as a father I'm glad I, I did try to do that my, my, my children may accuse me of doing it a little bit too much like you, you were a little overboard dad listen I'd rather be accused of that than dad you just gave us everything and let us live wickedly and however we want to live I'd rather them say dad you, you, you went really overboard on a lot of things in our lives listen to me the manifestation of a parent that loves their children is not a parent that lets their children do whatever they want to do. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews 12, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son that he received. The mark of true love, Father, is you being able to step in and discipline when discipline is needed. It doesn't mean you beat the tar out of your ch children. Beaten never did any good to them. Discipline with corrective actions is what needs to take place. You have to be balanced. And, and listen, there were times, there were times when I wanted to beat mine. Right? But I'm going to tell you something about my life. I, I've talked to my kid about this several times. I love my dad, but my dad was way overboard when it came to spanking. My dad would literally whip you until he had no energy left. Now, we deserve to be whipped. I ain't going to lie to you about that. Probably more than, he's probably just catching up on the times he missed us. <laughs> but let me say this one thing I realized in my, my life is the purpose and I've told Micaiah if I have flaws I'm very open with my kids they, they come to me with complaints about all kind of stuff that I'm doing wrong and I'm okay with that you know because I do a lot wrong I don't have it all figured out but they've come to me and, and said, I don't like the way you do that, I don't like the way you do that. And I, my response, you can ask any of them, my response is this. The places where I fail in your life, correct that for your children. Because I've had to do that with my own children. And you can ask them, I would measure, like you get 10 licks. They never did understand why I did that until got, they got older. It's because my dad didn't give no 10 licks. 
And I knew I personally needed a restraint. You get five, you get ten. I needed a restraint. Where your father went wrong, correct it. Correct it. Listen, that's the only way we can build a generation that's better. That's better. But the manifestation of true love is that you do correct your children. You can't, you can't go through life not correcting them because the jails are full of people who were not corrected. You see the evil, you hide yourself, you discipline your children. Go to Proverbs. Proverbs 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you young men something. I recommend that you read Proverbs chapter 5, 6, 7 once a year. Maybe twice a year. Maybe three times a year. There's a strange woman in there. There's a woman that's trying to get somebody to commit adultery in there. The reason I recommend you read that, there's a lot of women like that in the world. There's a lot of men like that. But I'm just telling you, we're, we're preaching to the men today, right? I'm going to tell you, one thing that will hinder your relationship with your wife is putting your eyes where they don't belong. If you made the commitment and you married that woman, you be faithful to her and you put her first in your life. She's the love of your life. Keep it that way. Do not be wandering with your eyes. Read Proverbs 5, 6, 7. You're going to get in trouble. The Bible says her feet lead down to hell. Look at this. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs 6. Look at verse 20. My son, keep thy father's commandment. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Whose commandment? Whose commandment are you supposed to keep? Now listen, again, if you didn't have a godly father, your heavenly father is godly. You need to keep his commandment. But notice the commandment of this godly father. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. When thou wakest, it, will, uh, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. Reproofs of instruction are a way of life to keep thee. Notice the father's commandment, the mother's uh, uh, law. Notice it's keeping you from something bad. To keep thee from the evil woman. That, from the flattery of the tongue of the strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart. Neither let her take thee with her eyelids. By the means of a whorish woman, a, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for precious life. Man, I'm telling you what, I saw the example of this. I saw the example of this in the church I got saved in. I'm not going to call their names. One of them, the man is dead now. But I saw the example of this. There was a loose woman in our, well, we were trying to win them is what we was trying to do. They, they weren't part of our church. But um, this woman, very loose, she had four or five kids by four different men and then was with another man working on another batch of kids and she was getting a check from this one and a check from that one and a check from this one and a check from that one for each kid. And this man, I was trying to win him. She had two kids by him, or well, one on the way, once that child was there. And um, he came to me. He said, I can't leave her because if I leave her, I don't have anything because she is raking me over the coals for everything I got. And if I do, she tries to get me locked up. I can't even pay child support and they will keep me locked up. She, this woman was beating herself up and saying that he did it. <laughs> she got caught. She actually got caught. And saying that he was beating her because he was saying, I got to leave, I'll just pay the child support, but I'm leaving. And when he got ready to leave, she beat herself up, have him locked up. And he couldn't even pay the child support, so he had had to stay in jail until he could get that paid off. It was bad. It was bad. You say, where was he at? Last time I seen him, he was in an old rundown trailer. Old rundown trailer. Didn't have enough money to buy food. And scared half to death that she was going to find him. He was sending her payments for child support, scared half to death she was going to find him and have him locked up again. I saw that prime example. Let me tell you something, man. Drink waters out of your own cistern. 
you stay with that woman of your youth and you be faithful to her, the grass is not greener on the other side. You may think it's greener, it's not. You'll never find a woman that loves you and can put up with you the way the woman that you're with now that's been with you that length of time puts up with you. You won't, you just won't. Learn to love her and appreciate her and adore her because the grass, listen, the grass is not always greener on the other side. People think the grass is greener on the other side. But you know what? Grass is always green over a septic tank. It doesn't mean it's good stuff. Be careful. Be careful. I'm, listen to me. 50 years from now, 60 years from now, every woman that you're lusting after is going to be all wrinkly. And things are going to be sagging on you and her. You need to learn to love the one you have now. Because in the end, this flesh ain't going to make no difference. It's not going to make any difference. We all age. I mean, I got, I got little patches here and there and bald spots where it's so... I, I thought, I thought, I thought that I was losing hair on the side. Come to find out, I still got hair, but it's translucent. So it looks like bald spots everywhere. You know? Listen, you're going to get old. Learn to love the one you're with now. And so we see that instruction. We see the instruction from fathers. And, and, and mothers that's given. Be careful about your life. Let's go back to the book of Jeremiah chapter 35. Let's actually look at these children. How to honor a godly father. How to honor a godly father. The first thing I notice is this. The word obey is all through the scriptures in this passage. Notice verse number 8. Jeremiah 35, verse 8, Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he charged, had charged us to drink no wine, and so on and so forth. They said they obeyed in all. Can I say something to you? Partial obedience is the same thing as disobedience. We're going to go to this passage. I'm going to prove this from you, uh, to you from the Scriptures. A lot of people think, well, I did, I did, I did some of what he said, so I'm okay. I want you to notice verse 2. Verse 2 about these Rechabites. I, I want to ask you something about your personal life. You know, a lot of people come to church and they're in, on the best behavior at church, ain't they? They're on the best behavior at church. Let me ask you, what kind of behavior are you on in secret? When nobody else is watching you and you have the opportunity to do wrong, what kind of behavior are you on then? On your job. When all the other guys are vile and profane, what kind of behavior do you have? That's the real you. Look at verse 2. Go into the house of the Rechabites and speak unto them and bring them to the house of the Lord in one of the chambers and give them to drink. You know what they do? You know what the Lord tells Jeremiah to do? I want you to go get them. I want you to go get these Rechabites. I want you to bring them in private. Come into the house of God and I want you to go into a chamber by yourself in private where nobody else can see them and nobody else will know they did wrong and then I want you to set wine before them because I want to illustrate something to you about how Israel should be in secret they're not obedient to me but when they come into the house of God they pretend like they love me but I want you to see how these Rechabites are. Bring them into the house of God. Bring them into this private chamber. And I want you just to set all this wine in front of them and get them cups. Get them nice cups and lay it out. You know what the Rechabites were not willing to do? They were not willing to be disobedient. When nobody else was watching, they knew God was watching. Listen. You, a lot of people can, can walk the walk and talk the talk when everybody else is around them. But how about in private? What are you in private? You know the private person is the real you. 
What you do in private, what you put your eyes on in private, what you think about in private, what you do in private, that's the real you. These people were real, even in private. They, they, notice verse 18. Notice what it says. Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because I have obeyed the, ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab, kept all his precepts, and done according to all. Notice the word that's there. Obeyed, kept all, done according unto all. Listen, a lot of people say, well, Lord, I, I did part of what you wanted me to do. Did you do it all? Let me show you something. Go to, go to uh, 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. A lot of people go halfway with God. They don't go all the way. They go halfway. What about your life? Is it a life completely sold out to God? Or are you a halfway Christian? Notice what he says here in verse 19. Wherefore whence did, uh, didst thou not... Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst uh, fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, this is 1 Samuel 15, verse 20, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. 1 Samuel 15, 21, But the people took of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief things which have been utterly destroyed and sacrificed unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Samuel said, Hath the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of ram, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath re also rejected thee from being king. Let me tell you something. He says it's better to obey than to sacrifice. My children, and oftentimes children in general, misunderstand a godly parent. Um, my children have brought me gifts. And I'm thankful my kids love me. Aren't you? Don't you like to get gifts sometimes? It's nice. But my kids know this. You can bring gifts all day long. It's better to obey than for you to bring sacrifices. You sacrifice your money when you give a gift, don't you? You know what's more important than giving a godly man a gift? You can give me gifts, you can spend your money all day, you can sacrifice your money and your time to go get the gift. But what is the most important, to, most important thing to a godly man, the most important thing is for you to obey. You to obey God. I want my children to have a relationship with God and be obedient to God. That's more important. Listen, if they never, listen, if my children never give me another gift ever again physically, and they're obedient to God, that means more to me than anything they could ever give me. Now, that's my granddaughter, and she's getting restless. She's giving me the signal. Hey, hey, what you doing? Bye. <laughs> She's giving me the signal. Papa, you're going a little long. All right. So, that's it. Staring me down the whole way. All right, Jeremiah. Let's go back to Jeremiah. So, listen. Obey that godly father. Now, here's the amazing thing that God does. God does an amazing thing with this, this uh, family here. I don't want to say something to you, Father. The reason why you need to be careful in your home is because God wants to use you as an example to teach somebody else. Would you let Him use you to teach somebody else? You know what? When, when the Lord... We read in this passage. I'm not going to rehash this. When the Lord wanted to teach Israel 
how he wanted them to obey. You know what he does? He says, come over here and watch these Rechabites. I want you to see how they obey their father. They're an exceptional people because they do exactly what he said. And this is what you're not doing with me. Can I ask you something? Can God use your home as an example to teach somebody else what they should be doing? That's how your home should be. Preacher, I can't live up to that. I know, none of us can. But if you'll be faithful, God will build that kind of testimony in your home. That, whose choice is that? That's yours. That's yours. He says, come over here, I want you to see these Rechabites. You know what? Listen, do you remember the book of Job? What, what, did, what did God ask the devil? <laughs> Have you considered my servant Job? You know, when God wanted to set the devil straight, you know what he did? Come on over here. How about this fellow Job right here? Have you thought about him? You say nobody loves me because they want to. What about this guy? You know what he did the second time? After he took his family, after he took all his wealth, he told the devil, he still holds fast his integrity. How about you? Now listen, I don't want to be in the position of Job, but I do want God to use my life as a testimony of the way people ought to live. Let's look at this last thing. Look at verse number 19 and we'll close. I kept you long. Not every message is, is uh, the same, so I hope you'll come and hear. And I, I tried my best to try to stir you up as fathers. And I hope it was a blessing to you. Look at um, Jeremiah 35, verse 19. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want for a man to stand forever before me. How long? Forever. Listen to me. This is the question people ask. Why? Why should I serve the Lord? Why? Why should I do this? There is a blessing associated with serving the Lord. You say, uh, well, will I get money in the bank? Who cares about money? Money is not the goal. Peace and happiness and joy, that's the true goal in life. Right? Listen, money is not Money is not what is important. What's important in life is that we are obedient and God blesses us. He'll do that for you. Listen, in the end, you know what these Rechabites, you say, was well, it worth it to serve the Lord? It was to them. Amen. It was worth it to be obedient to them. You know what God said? One little thing. Brother Marshall, they, their, their father gave them a commandment. And they just did what their father said. Honor your father and mother, the scripture says. Hello. They just did what they were supposed to do. And God said, because you did what you were supposed to do, I, you're not going to lack for a man standing before me forever. Now, I don't know where they're at now. But there's some Rechabites somewhere because he said forever. There's some descendants of Rechabites somewhere because he said forever. It's going to be amazing one day when we get up there and stand before God and he says, you see that little crowd right there in 2023 that are still standing for me? Those are descendants of Rechabites. Did you know that? That would be a blessing, won't it? Listen, what about your home? What kind of example are you setting in your home? Are you the kind of father that your children can follow? I'm not saying sinless. Are you the kind of example you need to be? If not, why don't you change that? Why don't you get that settled? Some of you are not only fathers, your your, your grandfathers, your great grandfather. Are you a great great yet? Anybody here a great great yet? You're a great great. That's a lot of greats. Listen. Happy Father's Day to you. I hope as a father you're setting the right example in your home. 
If not, why don't you go ahead and start turning the corner and get it right. Get it right. Go forward, do something for the Lord. Amen. All right, if y'all stand, actually stay seated. I want every father here to stand up, will you?